My name is Johan Norberg, a writer and an analyst, and I was born and raised here in Sweden. I was three years old when the Nobel Prize in Economics was awarded to Milton Friedman here in Stockholm. This is Stockholm City Hall, the traditional place for the Nobel banquet. This is where Milton Friedman celebrated his prize. Milton Friedman did a lot more than win the Nobel Prize here in Stockholm. He had a thought-provoking message that won him thousands of advocates and opponents all over the world. In 2002, I had the pleasure of meeting Professor Friedman, and the thing that struck me was his intellectual curiosity. By Thomas Jefferson. His research led him to believe in the power of free markets and economic freedom, while many people today place a greater emphasis on government safety nets and greater financial equality. On this 30th anniversary of Milton Friedman's PBS television series, I'll revisit his ideas on the struggle between freedom and equality. Major funding for this program was provided by Thomas W. and Diane Smith. Additional funding was provided by Chris and Melody Rufer, Olaf Neil Sunda, Robert and Marion Oster, and the Hickory Foundation. No matter where you come from, whenever there's a problem, it's tempting to look to the government for solutions. Since the recession of 2008, we've seen unprecedented government intervention in the financial sector and in the automotive industry. We've seen new spending programs, more tariffs and new regulations, and we've seen the largest buildup of government debt in American history, a debt that might haunt us for generations. Some people blame the financial crisis on Milton Friedman and his theories of free markets. But Friedman would say that economic freedom is not just to reap the rewards when times are good, it's also to bear the consequences of your actions when times are bad. We don't have free markets as long as speculators can keep the profits when they win, but send the losses to the taxpayers when they lose. I was born and raised in Sweden, and my country has made an effort to make people's lives more equal. To reduce differences of outcome, we tax heavily and redistribute wealth among our citizens. And many people in the United States advocate a system like ours. If, on the other hand, the government gives everybody the same freedom to work and reap the rewards, some will do better than others. The result will be equality of opportunity, but not equality of outcome. Here in the United States, you've accepted more inequality of outcome. And over the past 30 years, a debate has been raging between these two competing alternatives. Can we live with economic freedom, even though it doesn't guarantee a specific result? even though it's built on the ongoing destruction of old ideas and businesses that are no longer competitive. Can we accept freedom, even though freedom to choose also means that we will not all be equally successful? To answer these questions, Milton Friedman traveled the world to examine various economic systems. He concluded that for most people, an emphasis on economic freedom would lead to both individual and political freedom. Many commentators say that Milton Friedman did more for freedom than anybody else in recent decades. He convinced many nations to embrace economic freedom. In the US, he led the effort to abolish the military draft, which he considered nothing less than slavery. It is long past time that we return to our basic heritage, got rid of the compulsion in our military service, and return to a voluntary system. When Milton Friedman died in 2006, The Economist magazine's obituary had the headline, How Milton Freed Man. On the other hand, writers like the Canadian anti-capitalist Naomi Klein claim that he helped authoritarians by advising them to adopt free market economic policies. Most controversially, in 1975, Friedman traveled to Chile to lecture about economic liberalization. And he also met with the dictator, Augusto Pinochet. And in 1988, he went to China to talk to the communist leaders about economic reform. So who's right? Friedman would advise us to test his ideas by examining the evidence of recent history. Have his ideas changed our world? 
for better or for worse, whose assessment of his legacy is right? Milton Friedman is one of the most famous and influential economists of our time. He was born on July 31st, 1912, and received the Nobel Prize in Economics in 1976. As a professor of economics at the University of Chicago, he had great influence on the entire field of economics. He was an author and an advisor to several presidents. He spent most of his life promoting the benefits of a free market economic system. Friedman thought that most people are well equipped to take care of themselves, no matter where they come from, no matter what gender they are, no matter which race or creed they belong to. He thought that freedom from government barriers gave everybody the freedom to try, to start a business, to learn a trade, to get a good job, to become rich if they're successful. And it denied the powerful and the vested interest the right to distort the outcome. In 1980, Friedman presented his ideas to America through a 10-hour PBS series that was called Free to Choose. He traveled to places he felt could best communicate his ideas. Milton Friedman began his PBS series Free to Choose in New York City with a bit of personal history because he felt that it was important to remember how America's success story began. This statue is iconic. It represents freedom. And for the immigrants who were welcomed by the Statue of Liberty in the late 1800s and the early 1900s, America was truly a land of opportunity. They poured ashore in their best clothes, eager and expectant, carrying what little they owned. They were poor, but they all had a great deal of hope. Once they arrived, they found, as my parents did, not an easy life, but a very hard life. Friedman's parents passed through these doors here on Ellis Island, and they shared this background with millions of immigrants from all over the world. About a fifth of all Swedes migrated from my homeland to America to find a place where their own talents and hard work made a difference. Here on Ellis Island, they met the new world for the first time, and then they moved to the cities and to the frontier in search of the promise of the American dream. Not all of them found it, but many did. There were many rewards for hard work, enterprise, and ability. Life was hard, but opportunity was real. There were few government programs to turn to and nobody expected them. But also, there were few rules and regulations. There were no licenses, no permits, no red tape to restrict them. They found, in fact, a free market, and most of them thrived on it. This is exactly the same kind of a factory that my mother worked in when she came to this country for the first time at the age of 14, almost 90 years ago. And if there had not been factories like this here then at which she could have started to work and earned a little money, she wouldn't have been able to come. And if I existed at all, I'd be a Russian or a Hungarian today instead of American. But over the next 75 years, the United States began to restrict the workings of the free market. Every line of business was regulated, and soon the highest tax rate surpassed 70%. In 1980, when Friedman wanted to show a truly free economy, he took the viewer to the other side of the world. If you want to see how the free market really works, this is the place to come. Hong Kong, a place with hardly any natural resources. About the only one you can name is a great harbor. Yet the absence of natural resources hasn't prevented rapid economic development. When Milton Friedman rode on this ferry in 1980, Hong Kong was not a part of China, but was leased to Britain as a colony. And it had just made an incredible journey, one that demonstrated to the world that even the poorest countries can develop. After the Second World War and the Communist Revolution in China, this rock in the middle of nowhere became a refugee camp with millions of extremely poor people. To Milton Friedman, the scientist, this was a perfect natural experiment to test his theory about free markets. Hong Kong had no prospects, no natural resources and little land that could be cultivated. 
But almost by accident, it was given economic freedom. The British government couldn't be bothered with local Hong Kong affairs. And the governor here happened to favor free markets. So Hong Kong never introduced all those policies that other governments did. No tariffs, no regulations or government intervention in the economy. So the economy could evolve in a natural way. As a result, Hong Kong became an economic powerhouse. When Friedman came to Hong Kong in 1980, it could boast statistics on life expectancy and infant mortality that equaled Western countries. Incredibly, it was on its way to become richer than its colonial ruler, Britain. This thriving, bustling, dynamic city has been made possible by the free market. Indeed, the freest market in the world. The free market enables people to go into any industry they want, to trade with whomever they want, to buy in the cheapest market around the world, to sell in the dearest market around the world. But, most important of all, if they fail, they bear the cost. If they succeed, they get the benefit. And it's that atmosphere of incentive that has induced them to work, to adjust, to save, to produce a miracle. And what a miracle it's been. Friedman was standing next to the tallest building on the skyline. And just look at that skyline now. There are more skyscrapers here than in all of New York City. Between 1950 and 2000, Hong Kong's GDP per capita increased more than 10 times. Friedman concluded that this success was due to the free market. This hasn't been achieved by government action, by someone sitting in one of those tall buildings telling people what to do. It's been achieved by allowing the market to work. The complete absence of tariffs or any other restrictions on trade is one of the main reasons why Hong Kong has been able to provide such a rapidly rising standard of life for its people. In 1980, when Milton Friedman wanted to see a truly free market, he had to come here, to Hong Kong. Since then, much of the world has followed in Hong Kong's path. In an effort to get out of its stagnation of the 1970s, the US and Western Europe began to return to the ideals of free competition. Taxes were lowered, tariffs were reduced, and regulations slashed. Hong Kong is now part of China, but at times it seems more like Hong Kong took over China rather than the other way around. The communist leaders on the mainland, they looked around at their more successful neighbors and then decided to set their own markets free. And Asia's other giant, India, they also opened their economy to the rest of the world. In Eastern Europe, communism collapsed because the economy never could satisfy the needs of the people, and they were longing for freedom. In 1991, in the small Baltic country of Estonia, Prime Minister Mart Lahr took his inspiration from Milton Friedman's book, Free to Choose, which was based on the TV series. He decided to imitate the Hong Kong model, with zero tariffs, a flat tax, and a minimum of regulation. Despite its problems with the 2008 financial crisis, Estonia is widely seen as the most successful of the former communist economies. Free markets have spread around the world. At the same time, we've seen the fastest human progress ever. And it has been led by the countries that opened up their economies. In fact, average incomes around the world have almost doubled. Think about these statistics. Globally, extreme poverty has been more than half since Milton Friedman did his series in 1980. Amazingly, 730 million people have been liberated from poverty. Every year, life expectancy around the world has increased by three months, despite AIDS and despite malaria. And to me, one of the most heartening facts is that the risk of parents losing their child in infancy has almost been cut in half. These were the results that Friedman predicted free markets could bring about. As people got more wealthy, they could begin to deal with the most important challenges in their lives. But Friedman had another reason why he wanted authoritarian dictatorships to liberalize their economies. Political freedom. Human and political freedom 
has never existed and cannot exist without a large measure of economic freedom. Those of us who have been so fortunate as to have been born in a free society tend to take freedom for granted, to regard it as a natural state of mankind. It is not. It is a rare and precious thing. He thought that economic freedom would directly lead to political freedom. When people begin to make their own decisions and gain confidence in their ability to take care of themselves, Friedman believed they would begin to demand personal and political freedoms as well. When we say that a market is free, it sounds a bit like a dog-eat-dog -dog economy. But that is not what Friedman had in mind. He thought that the best explanation of why the free market works was developed more than 200 years ago in Scotland, where Adam Smith taught at the University of Glasgow. Smith's book, The Wealth of Nations, explains why free choice and voluntary association is often more well-functioning and orderly than commands from the top. Voluntary association is what we do together of our own free will. When these people buy and sell to each other and none is subject to force or fraud, that is voluntary association. It is anything that is going on between consenting and not. It wasn't always like this. America was founded with something different in mind. Milton Friedman came here to Philadelphia, an independence hall, to reflect on the founding fathers. Almost 200 years ago, a remarkable group of men gathered in this room to write a constitution for the new nation that they had helped to create a few years earlier. They were a wise and learned group of people. They had learned the lesson of history the great danger to freedom is a concentration of power, especially in the hands of a government. They were determined to protect the citizens of the new United States of America from that danger. And they crafted their constitution with that in mind. That constitution has served us well. It has enabled us to preserve our freedom for close on to 200 years. But in the past 50 years, we have been forgetting the lesson that the wise men knew so well. From regarding government as a threat to our freedom, we have come more and more to regard government as a benefactor from which all good things flow. Friedman was afraid that a bigger government would threaten the incredible results of economic freedom. Because the economy is not a zero-sum game. In other words, we're not fighting over ever smaller pieces of the pie. The pie is constantly growing larger as people and businesses become more productive. And the world is getting wealthier all the time. In the last 100 years, with relatively free markets, we have created more wealth than in the 100,000 years before. And as a result, we have reduced extreme poverty around the world more than people ever dreamed was possible. Americans and Swedes alike, we're all obsessed with our monthly paycheck. But how much that paycheck is really worth, to find out that is not as simple as it seems. What's the inflation rate? Do goods and services cost more or less today than they did last year? We have to look at what we can buy, how far that paycheck takes us. And that has increased dramatically because entrepreneurs become rich by constantly reducing the price of everything we want. Let's look at a couple of everyday items. 25 years ago, you had to work for 456 hours to be able to buy a cell phone. Today, after all the productivity increases that businesses and innovators have introduced, you only have to work for four hours. And of course, it's a better deal today. This is not just a phone. It also doubles as a texting device, a calendar, a camera, almost everything. In these same 25 years, the cost of a personal computer has been reduced from 435 hours to 25 hours. And you really couldn't compare it to those original PCs that wouldn't be able to run any of the software or the operating systems that we use today. What about a basic necessity like food? Well, we don't see the recent dramatic productivity increases that we see when we look at electronics. The great leap forward in agricultural technology happened 100 years ago. But with a long-term perspective, you certainly see a lot of change. 
1920, you had to work for 37 minutes to afford half a gallon of milk. Today, you wouldn't have to work more than seven minutes. And in 1920, it cost you two and a half hours to buy three pounds of chicken. Today, you'd get away with less than 14 minutes. Professor Friedman noticed something similar 30 years ago. Over a quarter of a century ago, I bought secondhand a desk calculator for which I paid $300. One of these little calculators today, which I can buy for $10 or so, will do everything that did and more beside. What produced this tremendous improvement in technology? Friedman's conclusion was that accepting differences of outcome does not just make the winners better off, but the losers as well. People with a lot of money can afford to be early adopters. They can pay ridiculous amounts for the first versions of cell phones and personal computers. And that's a good thing for us, because they create bigger markets so the companies get revenue, so that they can streamline production and create lower cost versions so that all of us can buy one. And historically, this seems to be the case. Free markets regularly turn luxuries into consumer goods. This may seem hard to believe, but the average rate of ownership for refrigerators, air conditioners, and dishwashers is higher among poor American households today than they were for all American households in the early 1970s. When people are free, they are able to use their own resources most effectively, and you have a great deal of productivity, a great deal of opportunity. The major beneficiaries are always a small man. The man who has power, who's at the top of a society, he's going to do well whatever kind of a society you have. It's a society which gives the small man the opportunity to go his way, which is going to benefit him the most. One thing is certain. Rarely in the history of mankind has freedom made such rapid progress as it has since Friedman produced Free to Choose in 1980. Whole populations yearning for freedom tore down the walls. Communism collapsed, the Soviet Union was abolished, and its satellite states were set free. Military dictatorships and the apartheid system were swept away. Most of the world embraced free market capitalism. Democracy spread and living standards surged. So, what really happened in Chile and China after Milton Friedman's controversial visits in the 1970s and 80s? Well, Chile liberalized the economy radically, put an end to inflation and adopted free trade. And after a difficult period of adjustment, the country experienced rapid growth and improved living standards. The pressure for a democratic transition grew. In 1987, political parties were legalized. And in 1988, there was a referendum on whether the dictator Pinochet would remain in power for eight years. Pinochet lost and had to resign. And the country continued making economic progress under a center-left leadership. Chile is now a stable democracy. Here it seems that Friedman was proven right. Economic freedom created wealth, and wealth undermined the dictatorship. In China, that is not the case, at least not yet. The Communist Party still runs the show, and opposition is vigorously suppressed. Still, economic reform has made an enormous difference in China. It has turned the country into the world's biggest exporter, with the world's fastest growth rates. It has led to the greatest poverty reduction in any country anywhere, ever. And hundreds of millions of Chinese are experiencing personal freedoms that were unheard of 30 years ago. We'll have to see what happens next. As economies have liberalized, the results are stunning. Extreme poverty around the world has been halved since Milton Friedman did his show. In fact, more than 70,000 people have left poverty every day since the early 1980s. That's almost 3,000 every hour, 124 people every minute around the clock. But at the same time, we see a widespread hostility against a free market system that made this possible. 
freedom is not the natural state of mankind. It is a rare and wonderful achievement. It will take an understanding of what freedom is, of where the dangers to freedom come from. It will take the courage to act on that understanding if we are not only to preserve the freedoms that we have, but to realize the full potential of a truly free society. Equality sounds good, and some value equality of outcome more than anything else. The risk is that the outcome is that we're all equally poor. Market-based systems have made all of us richer, but some much richer than others. In the end, we have to decide whether this wealth is the problem, or whether poverty is the problem. As Milton Friedman put it in 1980, the society that puts equality before freedom will end up with neither. The society that puts freedom before equality will end up with a great measure of both.